our series is on spiritual maturity, and one of the concerns that I have is that the book of James allows us a vehicle to test each one of us and evaluate our own spiritual maturity. But the problem is, is if we don't take time to truly evaluate the things we're learning and to see where we stand, we may go through a series like this without knowing any more reality of where we really are than before we started. And so each week when you have the opportunity to look at this scripture from the book of James, look at it as an opportunity to evaluate where you personally are, where your walk personally is. Because my concern, as I said, is if we don't evaluate this, all we're going to do is we're going to gain some intellectual growth. We're going to gain maybe a little bit more surface knowledge of the scripture when the reality is we want to evaluate our walk so we know the areas that we need to grow in. So we know the areas that we need to mature in. Last week we looked at a key to spiritual maturity and it was the issue of the tongue and how we use our conversation. Um, the truly spiritual mature will live their life in such a manner that they are led of the Holy Spirit and therefore the fruit of the Holy Spirit being self-control will be evident in their life and evident through their mouth, through the things that they say, through the things that they don't say, through the things they choose to speak and the things they choose not to speak. And our tongue is a very clear indicator of where we are in our walk with God and in the area of spiritual maturity. Now on the back end of that, the rest of chapter three we're gonna look at today, and we're gonna see some true indications of our spiritual maturity. And understand that in context, this is all coming on the tail end of how we use our mouth. Do we use our, our mouth to praise and glorify God in all we do? Or do we use our mouths in order to tear others down and to say things that are unwholesome, to speak things that are wrong, you know, to do things that are just out of line with the word of God. And so that's the beginning that brings us to what we're studying today. But again, I want us to evaluate individually where we're at in the matter of spiritual maturity. So let's pray. And we're going to look at James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. So just a few verses to cover this morning because chapter 4 starts a totally different thought. So let's pray and then let's cover these. Father God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the fact that you give us, through your word, the opportunity to personally evaluate and assess where we are in our walk with you. And I pray, Lord, that as we make those assessments, that we'd be encouraged by where we're growing and by where we're demonstrating maturity. And I pray, Lord, that we would be challenged where we're not, where we're walking in spiritual immaturity, that we would be challenged and called by you to grow and to mature in those areas. I pray, Lord, that you would enable us through the power of your Holy Spirit to overcome the areas of struggle in our life and I pray, Lord, that you would also strengthen us to be strong in our walk, to be steadfast in our walk, to persevere, and that we would not be discouraged, but we would be overcomers in these areas of struggle. Lord, I pray that you would make the sin in our life evident and that we would be willing to change and walk away from it. I pray, Lord, again, that we'd be encouraged in the areas where we're walking rightly with you. And I pray, Lord, for the areas where maybe we're uncertain about where we really are in our walk with you that you would make that clear to each and every one of us and that in our heart we would be willing to do whatever it takes to be closer and walk in a way that more glorifies you. In Jesus' name, amen. The first thing we're going to look at this morning is the truly wise, the truly wise. It says in verse 13, who is wise and understanding among you? Now, if we remember our context from last week, this is a very legitimate question, considering that they had a wrongful desire to be, to be teachers. Remember last week, James said, not many of you shall claim to be teachers or shall presume to be teachers because a teacher will give a stricter or stronger account. And, and there's a responsibility that comes with it. But in this Jewish culture, there were many who had, had gotten saved and their goal was position. Their goal was title. Their goal was religious position. Their goal was recognition or accolades, the things that they thought came with the responsibility of teaching. And so James says today in verse 13, who is wise and understanding among you? A legitimate question. They were puffed up. They were prideful. They thought they should be teachers because of an array of different reasons, none of which were the calling of God. And he's saying, who's really wise? 
Who really has understanding among you? And then he goes on and he clarifies it. This is what it would look like. Let him, the one who desires to be wise, the one who desires to have understanding, let him show it by his good life. And then he defines that. By deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. Think about this for a minute. Who's wise and understanding among you? You can almost hear just a tad bit of sarcasm in that statement because again, remember, they were elevating themselves. And in our culture today, don't we often do that too? We want to elevate ourselves or pursue positions, pursue different uh, accolades in life, pursue different authority in life that maybe we haven't even been called to. We want attention that may be wrong or, or we may want it for wrongful reasons. They were the same way. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life. Notice he didn't say let him show it by his education. He didn't say let it show it, let him show it by his knowledge. Let him show it by his experience. Let him show it by the amount of money he's earned. Let him show it by the amount of material goods he possesses. Let him show it by anything else. He didn't say anything else. And he certainly didn't say, let him show it by his proclamation that he is a teacher or professes to be a teacher. He said, let him show the wise and understanding way by his good life. And there's a lot to be said there for us. How do we show our walk with Christ? How do people know that we're walking with him? We can show it by our good life. Now, what does that good life look like? It looks by, like deeds that are done in humility. And the word there is really meekness. And meekness means power under control. Let him show it by his meekness. Deeds done in meekness. And where does that come from? That comes from wisdom. And so we've got some reasoning going on here with James that we need to follow. Those who are wise, it will show up in their life through meekness, power under control, and they will therefore do acts and practice things that are done with a humble spirit, that are done with a humble heart, that are done in a way that glorify God, that glorifies God. They come from wisdom. Wisdom leads to meekness. Meekness will always be demonstrated outward by humility. By humility. We don't live in a very humble culture. We don't live in a very humble society. We live in a society that tells us, make yourself to be everything that you can be. Make yourself to look like you're more than even you are. Give the appearance of what? Of pride, give the appearance of knowing everything, give the appearance of understanding everything. Our culture has really, really done us an inservice, a, a disservice rather, by teaching us that we should really be fake. We should give an appearance of things that aren't reality, <laughs> that aren't true. When for the Christian, the truth of the matter is, our life should be everything about making God all about making God large, about making God the source of knowledge, about making God the source of wisdom, about making God the source of every blessing we have, about giving Him all glory in everything we do. And yet it's often opposite, even among us as Christians. How often do we struggle with pride and saying, look what I've done. Look what I've accomplished. Look what I've been able to do. Look at the things I've been able to walk and do in my life. Now, it's okay that we do things. It's okay that we accomplish things. In fact, we're called to, but we're called to do it in such a manner that everything we do and everything we accomplish points back to who? To the God that we serve, to our Lord Jesus Christ. And those who are truly wise will be acting and doing good deeds in a manner of meekness. Power under control. Power under control. The great example of meekness is always the racehorse. It's a 2,000 pound animal 
that if out of control can do great damage and do great harm to everything and everyone that's in its way. But yet that racehorse, that thoroughbred, when under control of a proper trainer and under the control of a proper jockey does what? Looks majestic as it runs down that track in the exact manner that that jockey wants that horse to go. That's the example of meekness. Power that is harnessed. Power that is under control. Power that knows when to display itself and power that knows when to hold itself back. Those are the kind of deeds that the mature carry out. So who is wise and who is understanding among you? Let him show it by a good life. By deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. How many of you recognize with me that humility, meekness, is sometimes a tough thing to do in our own lives? It is. We get something done, we accomplish something, and you know, there's that instant <clears throat> that comes with it. You know, look what I've done, look what I've accomplished, when really, you know, I know we can't evaluate a person's Christianity by if they point to the, to the sky or not. But really, that picture of what these athletes are doing these days when they score a touchdown or hit a home run and pointing to the sky, really, that is a slight picture of what we should be doing all the time. When you have a great accomplishment at your workplace or in your company, why are we not pointing to Christ? And I'm not talking about literally standing there and doing this, but why are we not pointing and saying, look what my God's done in me? Look what he's done through me. Why are we not down on our knee, praying in the midst of a great accomplishment? Why are we not on our face, crying out to our God and saying, my God, I could not have done this apart from you. Why are we not in our conversation rather than saying, hey, look what I've done, saying, look what my God has done in my life and in the life of my family or in my company, or in my workplace, or in whatever it is, in my hobby. You know, why are we not quick to respond with the statement of, look what my God has done. Look how my Lord has blessed me. And I know at times we are, but is it not true that we could do a better job of that? Is it not true that we should take less credit for the things that are going on in our life and give more credit to the one who created us? And the one who has said that he has ordained from before time the good works that we're doing right now. If that scripture from Ephesians is true, that he has ordained from before time the good works that we're doing now, then who is it that empowers us in those good works? It's him. And that's that picture of meekness. That's that picture of humility that we need to understand. Look at Matthew 7, verses uh, 24 to 27. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. You see, that's what we're about as Christians. That's what we should be focusing on. It's not just learning the words, but it's putting them into practice. It's like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. How many great crashes do we need to see in the lives of those who proclaim the name of Christ before we recognize in our individual lives that we better not just know the word but we better practice and do what it says and the spiritually mature do just that they practice what it says my heart breaks at the thought of how many people in our country and in our world think they're okay with Jesus Christ because they said some prayer 20 years ago and have never done anything with it my heart breaks because there's more to it than just saying I accepted Jesus in my heart. That is not good enough. That is not the standard that he called us to. He said that he wants to be Lord and master of our life. And that means a submissive heart that says you're my all and all I do is for you. 
Now, I understand that's a growing progress, a process, rather. And we must progress in that direction. I understand that. But I do. My heart breaks time and time again when I see people consistently live their lives in a manner that opposes the scriptures, but yet they think they're okay in Christ. The book of 1 John clearly states that those who are truly in Christ, the general practice of their life will be one of righteousness. Now, does it mean anybody in here is perfect? We're all very far from it. But it does mean that we are growing towards more righteous decisions each and every day in our life. And we need to see that. Back in James chapter 2, it says, But someone will say, You have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. Genuine faith will always show itself, if you remember when we studied this a few weeks ago, in genuine works. In genuine works. Now, don't be too quick to over-evaluate this again, because some genuine works will never be seen by others if we do them rightly. So you are to evaluate your own life. I can't evaluate your life for you. You can't evaluate my life for me, although you can help. We can be tools in each other's lives. But truly, we have to get humble before a holy God and say, Lord, please show me my life. Show me my heart. Show me where I am living in a manner that pleases you. And show me where I'm living in a manner that is displeasing to you, that I might change it. So the truly wise do their deeds in humility or meekness, and it comes from wisdom, and that wisdom comes from God. The second point is the truly sinful, the truly sinful. This is important for us to see this morning. So we see the picture of what wisdom looks like, and now we see the opposite. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, these two areas of sin I believe are critical for us to recognize because when we don't recognize bitter envy and selfish ambition, they destroy us and they destroy us from the inside out. I believe these two areas are two of the most dominant areas of destruction within the life of the Christian, the true Christian, because when the true Christian allows envy and bitterness to take root, when the true Christian allows selfish ambition to override God's glory in their life, they are going to reap some things in their life that are very destructive and that can do great damage. And I sit back sometimes and observe the results of this in lives of people who I know are truly in Christ. I've seen them demonstrate fruit in their walk, but yet they've allowed themselves to get harboring, holding on to, grasping and not letting go of bitter envy and selfish ambition. And I watched the wheels come off. I watched their whole life fall apart and they can't seem to look inside to see what it is that's causing the problem. And I hope that that's not any of us this morning. Bitter envy. Think about those two words together. An envious heart. One who wants what others have. One who desires what God has not given to them. One who has a bitterness that wells from within towards others because of God's blessing in their life. When we think of it that way, we think how foolish is that? But yet how easy is it to fall into an envious heart? How easy is it to look at that married couple that seems to have everything perfect when it may not be perfect in your life and say, man, I wish I'd have that. That part's okay. But then when it turns to, man, I wish I'd have that and why in the world do they have that? Why have they been blessed with that and I haven't? Look at how good things are for them and it's not that way for me. Why do I deserve this? You see, that's the way that bitter envy sneaks in. And it sneaks in sometimes by looking at success of others. We look at their life and we say, man, at first we say, man, look at how successful they are. Look at 
You know, they've got the perfect job or a company. They've got the financial security. Look at the toys that they have. We say, man, that's great. And then it turns to, why don't I have those things? Lord, I'm serving you. Why haven't you given me those things? And that bitterness that goes towards the Lord then starts spewing out towards others. Because remember, the scripture says that a bitter root defiles many. The truth of the matter is when we're bitter, it defiles everybody and everything in our life. The truth of the matter is, is that God has chosen for whatever reason not to give you those things that you're envious of. And the flip side of that truth also is that those who have all of those things sometimes aren't as happy as you think they are. It's not always everything, but it gets within us and we start harboring bitter envy. And there's some caution words that you need to be aware of when you speak them or when you think them. When we're asking why of our God in a comparative way towards someone else, it's the wrong question. The question is not why God, the question is who are you God and do you know what's best for me? That's the right question. It's not why do they or why have they or why would you give to them? The question is God, you know what's best. Maybe if you were placed in that situation, you wouldn't handle it well. Maybe it would cause some great destruction in your life. But we've got to watch bitter envy. Why is so-and-so in that position? I've been with this company for this many years, and why in the world am I not in that position? I work harder than they do. I try harder than they do. I know more than they do. Have you ever had those kind of thoughts? We must take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. Because if we don't capture that thought, it will lead to bitter envy. And bitter envy leads to inner destruction. But that second one is selfish ambition. And this is the one that I believe we've Christianized the American dream. We have taken the American dream of wealth, health, prosperity. We have taken that dream and we've tried to bless it with verses and say, it's okay for us to have selfish ambition. It is not okay for us to have selfish ambition. It is only okay for us to have a perspective of, I'm going to do what I'm going to do to God's glory. I'm going to accomplish what I can accomplish only in the power and the strength of our Lord. And that's a fine line, isn't it? Sometimes it's hard to distinguish between what am I doing in my own strength and what am I doing in God's strength. And one of the good ways to evaluate that is by looking at who's receiving the attention. I have to look at that in my own life. Who's receiving the attention when I do this? Is the attention being directed towards me or is the attention being directed towards my God whom I serve? And what can I better do to make sure the attention goes in the right direction? Because it's very easy to like through selfish ambition the attention that's brought to you when you accomplish good things, or supposedly good things. Now the scripture doesn't say be lazy. The scripture doesn't say just sit back and say, okay God, whatever's gonna happen, I'm gonna let it happen. The scripture says work in such a way as if you're working for the Lord. So what does that mean? That means give it everything you've got, but do it in a manner that glorifies Him. And don't pursue through selfish ambition the things that will lift and exalt you or lift and exalt me, but what's going to lift and exalt the name of Jesus Christ high? This scripture is important. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, we'll look at the result in just a minute. But listen to these scriptures. Proverbs 14.30. A heart at peace gives life to the body. Don't miss that. A life, not that is peaceful, but a life that has a heart that is at peace no matter what our circumstances are. It doesn't mean everything's peaceful, but it means we are at peace in our heart no matter what our circumstances are. That gives life to the body. In other words, there are physical positive results to having a proper peace that comes from your relationship with Christ. No matter what circumstances you're in. No matter what situation you're in. But envy rots the bones. 
I've never understood, seriously, the concept of envy. Not that I've never been tempted by it. I've just never understood it. We're envious of others, thinking that somehow it's actually going to bring harm or do damage to them, when the reality is the only person it's corrupting at the core is us. And there are physical effects. Envy rots the bones. Now, I'm not saying that we should literally translate that, that your bones are going to break down because of envy, but I don't think we should ignore the fact that there's a physical effect to envy in our lives. I think we'd be foolish to ignore that. It destroys us, the picture is, from the inside out. It breaks us down at the core of our being. And how many of you have held envy for any period of time? When you have, have you not seen the results? All of a sudden, it just kind of lights up and you see it clearly and you're like, wow. Look at the damage that has been done. And the majority of the damage is internal, although it never stays internal. It does go external and affect others. Look at Proverbs 27 and verse 4. Anger is cruel and fury overwhelming. But who can stand before jealousy? Now, if we would list those three things, anger, fury, and jealousy, how many of us would think that jealousy would do the most damage? We wouldn't. We would probably go fury, anger, jealousy in most of our lists. Oh, but anger is cruel. There's damage that comes by it and through it. And fury can be overwhelming. But who can stand before jealousy? And the rhetorical answer is no one can stand before jealousy. It does great damage. And jealousy and envy are hand in hand. They go together. Look at 1 Corinthians 3.3. 3. We studied this just back a few months ago. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere men? So how did Paul attribute the actions of jealousy and quarreling among the believers? He attributed it to worldliness. You're just like the world. You're not living by Christian values. You don't have Christian uh, actions in place. And there's great damage that comes by it. We know that. Just look at the Corinthian church. It was almost destroyed because of these things. And then in Galatians 5.15, if you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. That's written to the churches in Galatia, the region of Galatia. It's written to churches, to believers. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, we really do do a lot of harm to each other, don't we? As Christians, we do. We do great damage to each other. We should be in the business of building each other up and edifying each other and making each other glorify God more in their lives, helping each other to do so. But yet we bite and devour each other. And if we aren't careful, we will literally destroy each other. And envy and selfish ambition do that. Envy in the state of looking at others and saying, I don't have what they have, so I'm going to bring you down. Now, we may never verbalize that, but that's what envy does. That's where it goes. When we harbor bitter envy, it's about bringing other people down so that we might feel in some warped way lifted up. It doesn't work. It never has. And selfish ambition says, I'll step on anybody I have to to get where I want to go. doesn't matter who it is, I'll step on you. I might do it with a smile on my face, but I'm going to step on you. And I'm going to bring damage to you so that I might be lifted up. And through that, we can destroy each other. Galatians 5, 26, just a few more verses now. says, let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Do you think if Paul was cautioning the first century church in Galatia to, about these things, that maybe we should be cautioned about them? Conceited, provoking and envying each other. Don't let it happen. Don't let it happen. And I believe that conceit, an inner pride, leads to those other two. Provoking and an envious heart. It really does. And then in Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4, this is what it says. Do nothing, absolutely nothing, out of selfish ambition 
or vain conceit. But in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Nothing. But in humility, consider others better than yourself. You know, when I start feeling just a tinge of, of envy, or when I start feeling a tinge of selfish ambition that's going to cause me to take wrongful action towards somebody, you know what I do as a practice? I try and find a way to serve that person immediately. Find some vehicle, make some choice to serve them to contradict and to overcome that envy that might be starting to well up or that selfish ambition that might cause me to step on that, go out of my way to serve them and to lift them up. And it's a good little tool that will help. So it says, but if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Now, boasting about it would be pride over a sinful heart. That seems foolish, but how many times have you heard believers boast about sin? Really, think about it. Have you done it in your own life where you're actually prideful and boasting about something that is sinful? Because you don't see it as sinful, even though it is. And denying it would be ignoring the truth and the reality of the situation. So if you have bitter envy, if you have selfish ambition, don't brag about it. That's foolish. That makes no sense. Get it under control and submit yourself to the Lord and to your brothers and sisters by serving them. But if you are in the midst of those situations, don't deny it either. Don't ignore it any longer. It's an opportunity today to grasp hold of it and let it go and not be captured by it. Such wisdom, and it's in quotations, meaning that's what they were proclaiming was wisdom. They wanted to be teachers. They wanted to be lifted up and they were acting out of envy and selfish ambition and it wasn't wisdom from God because wisdom from God shows itself in meekness and humility. But such wisdom, the kind they were claiming, does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, of the devil. It is based in pride and arrogance, and the core of it is from the devil himself. That's where a heart of selfish ambition and envy comes from. We need to understand that. It's pretty hard. Earthly, unspiritual, and of the devil. Those are not indicators of spiritual maturity. And we need to recognize that this morning. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. Everyone. Envy and selfish ambition lead to complete disorder and every evil practice. Is that the goal in your life? To live a life of disorder, to live a life where every evil practice is praying in you and about you and in your life. And I have to tell you that all these years in the ministry, I have watched those who claim to be wise in their own sight but are living with and harboring bitter envy and selfish ambition. I have watched that kind of disorder take place. Chaotic disorder. And I have watched literally every evil practice, everything you can imagine, come out of lives that are stuck in harboring bitter envy and having selfish ambition that will step on anybody. There's no limit to it. Every evil practice. Let's evaluate that and make sure that's not us, that that's not you, that that's not me. Last section, the truly righteous. Here's what it should look like. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all, pure. Pure is a good word, isn't it? Pure gold. Do you get more money for pure gold or pure gold that's mixed with something else? When I go to Van Gundy's on a weekly basis, I can tell you I get more money for number one bright copper than I get for brass. Copper mixed with something else. <coughs> but so often we settle for the mixture. We settle for a little bit of godliness with a whole lot of ungodliness. We settle for things that aren't pure and holy and righteous and good. But the wisdom that comes from God, the spiritually mature, will live a life that is first of all,
pure, undefiled, not stained, seeking purity and holiness. And then it's peace loving. Remember, peace within is a good thing. It brings about life. It gives life to your body. But you can't have peace within if you're living a double life. There's no peace at all when you're living what you're not saying you're living. When you're living in a way that's contrary to what you're saying you are and what you're about. But wisdom from heaven is pure and it's peace loving. It grasps, grasps on to peace and it creates peace. It is a peacemaker lifestyle and it's considerate. It's so annoying when we as Christians are inconsiderate. It really is. Little things. You go to a restaurant and you have a waiter or waitress that waits on you and serves you well and Christians are inconsiderate. They don't tip or cheapskates at time. We should give the best tips. We should be the best example of servanthood. Everywhere we go, everything we do, I know that's just a trivial example, but it, it's inconsiderate. We're inconsiderate of others at stoplights and stop signs. What do we do? We gun it through there rather than letting somebody go in front of us. We cut them off on the highway. It's inconsiderate. And we do it with a fish on the back of our car. You know? It's inconsiderate. We race to get the best seats at some venue that we're going to rather than giving that seat up to somebody by serving them. We step on people. But the mature Christian is considerate and submissive. We looked at that in Ephesians 5. Submit to one another out of reverence for God. The mature Christian is submissive. Doesn't mean they're weak. Certainly doesn't mean that they're going to allow themselves to be taken advantage of all the time. But it means that they're willing to submit to others if that will bring more glory to God. Full of mercy and good fruit. Full of mercy and good fruit. If we recognize truly the mercy we've been given, it makes it pretty easy to be merciful to others. We do not get what we deserve. So let's not think we need to give or it's our job to give others what they deserve. That doesn't really work. And that too will lead to bitterness of heart. Good fruit. Produce good fruit in line with what you say you confess. It's impartial. We've looked at that already. The fact that we're not to be impartial. I mean, that we are to be impartial, that we're not to judge wrongly, that we're not to show favoritism. And it's sincere. It's sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. Do you know that the way you choose and the decisions you make on a daily basis has so much to do with the harvest that you're going to reap? Same with me. And those who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. It's not always easy. It's not always easy to be a peacemaker. It's not always easy to lift other people up. It's not always easy to want to cheer on your brother and sister and their success when you are trying to think that why is that not what I have? Why is that not what I deserve? But it's always right. And we need to make sure we're doing the right things. We need to make sure that we're trying to have a harvest of righteousness. This scripture is rich, folks. And it's good and it's true. And it's something that we truly need to embrace if we want to be spiritually mature. Two scriptures to end. Proverbs 2, 6. For the Lord gives wisdom, and from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. The only true wisdom, this fly is about to die. The only true wisdom has a source from the Lord. That's it. It is the only source. He is the only source of all true wisdom. And then in James 1, although we've looked at this already, it brings things together very well. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault. And it will be given to him. But here's the qualifier. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt. Because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded man, unstable in all he does. If you've recognized this morning that in your Christianity there's an area of immaturity that sometimes rises up in bitter envy, 
sometimes in selfish ambition, and it comes that way into your life, and you recognize that this morning, then the truth of the matter is this. You have an opportunity to change it. You have an opportunity to go to the God who created you and ask him for wisdom and ask him for insight and ask him for all that you need. But don't doubt when you ask. Because if you doubt when you ask, you will receive nothing from the maker, the great maker, the one who created you and formed you and set from before time the good works that you are to walk in today and who loves you and cares for you and wants to allow you to reap a harvest of righteousness. I know that in my own life, the truth of the matter is I should be asking for that wisdom every day because I lack it greatly. And the great thing I know is that that's true in your life too. All of us lack godly wisdom in a moment by moment basis. Let's start asking the source of wisdom for that wisdom so that we might make better choices, that we might maximize his glory, and that we might reach people for his kingdom's sake. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the things you've taught me this week, Lord, through these six verses. I thank you, Lord, that you have laid out for us an evaluation through this book of James where we might truly evaluate ourselves and our walk and where we are. And that we don't have to stay stuck in the position we're in, but that we can change anything right now by your power and through your Holy Spirit. And I pray right now that if there are any who are harboring bitter envy, any who are driven by selfish ambition in a wrong way, not glorifying you in the midst of what they're doing, I pray you convict to the heart and that they'd be willing to repent and change of that. And I pray, Lord, that you would also help us understand the process we're in. Help us understand the growth and the direction we need to be going. And I pray that you'd encourage us in that growth, Lord, and that you would empower us to be overcomers. In Jesus' name, amen.